Hello, I'm Fakir Mushafar, and I've been around for a long time, like 80 plus years. <laughs> and I have been playing games with myself and other people for most of that period of time. I started my experiments out very early in life. Um, I grew up in a very boring place. I grew up in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And uh, I was, it's a small town on, it was in the time I was uh, living there, a young boy, it was on the Sisseton Sioux Indian Reservation. And the influence around us was very much uh, Native American. I went to grade school, I went to school with boys and girls who were also Native American. And um, I had a problem because they were not considered human beings and normal. They were treated very badly. But the Bureau of Indian Affairs back in the 1930s when I went to grade school decided that they had to try to make good white people out of all the Native Americans. So we had Sisset and Sioux people, we had uh, Crow, we had Blackfeet, we had all kinds of tribes represented in the kids that went to school there. So the Native Americans who I grew up had two choices. Uh, they could either stay on the reservation and or send their kids to school on the reservation schools, which in those days were more like reformatories and very harsh and very difficult. Or if they lived next to town or they were on the reservation land like our little town was, they could go to school with the townies in the white school. So in our little schools, uh, we had a number of Native American kids and I felt bad for them and I, in many ways, sympathized more with them than I did. <laughs> I fit better with them and their way of living than I did with the people around me. Um, they had a lot of myths and legends. They had different beliefs. They had a different belief structure than I did as a white kid. Uh, my family, uh, my dad, uh, was a, uh, started out as one of the pioneers in aviation. He learned to fly in the 1920s. And he and his partner barnstormed the Midwest, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota in an old biplane that they bought. This was after World War I in the 20s. And uh, he was a charming aviator, and he met my mother, who was from a German family in Minnesota. And uh, this was a very large family of 10 children. And the old patriarchal German grandfather had a nasty habit of um, uh, marrying off all his daughters and setting up his sons in little farms around him. He was an aristocratic German from Dusseldorf, Germany, and he was a patriarch. And so he wanted to build a little empire in a whole county in Minnesota. So the first children all had to obey, and he had his son set up in this farm and that farm expanding his territorial reach. Uh, and the girls he would marry off to someone on an adjoining farm so they would have control over that one. He even connected all the farms up with his own telephone system. So they couldn't answer to anybody except over his phone. My mother did not want to be married to the pig farmer on the adjoining farm. She was one of the later girls. So she um, ran away from home with the help of her brothers and sisters and caught a train from Minnesota for the farm, the German area community, to Aberdeen, where they had this ho-ho, a place where only place where women could work in those days would be as a secretary. So she ran off to Aberdeen on a midnight train and enrolled in secretarial school. My mother and father met at a party, I think a Halloween party, and she fell in love with the dashing aviator who wore helmets and putti pants and boots and made his living flying people and airmail around <laughs> the Midwest. So this is the family I grew up in. Um, my, my dad's family, were uh, the, the name was Loomis, and they were basically Scotch and English people who had settled homesteaders in South Dakota. My mother's parents all lived in a little town called Odessa, Minnesota, and that was all German. And they spoke German, and when she went to school, her first schooling up until high school was not in English, it was in German. So this was Deutsche, Deutschland. <laughs> 
So I had all these strange influences on me. Um, by the way, my mother was extremely religious in the German Lutheran Church, so I was brought up in the German Lutheran Church, the Missouri Cyanide Church, we call it, because it poisoned people. <laughs> it was as close to Martin Luther as you could possibly get in the German Church. Uh, the life there was very shallow and was not very uh, cultured. They didn't listen to opera, they didn't do anything <laughs> that we considered refined. And life there was very, very boring. So out of sheer boredom, I was a very curious boy, and I spent most of my early years in, in books and in libraries. And my great thrust in life was to find out what lie beyond the bounds of this dull place. And I found out that the lies and the thoughts and the feelings of the Native American kids that I, were my friends and I went to school with was a whole lot more interesting. They had a whole different view about life than we did. So I just gravitated as time went by more and more into finding out and congregating and mixing with the Native American people around us and going out to their places and their religious ceremonies, which we still had when I was a boy in the 1930s. The whiteies, the townie people, would go out because it was a joke and a laugh to them. They would go out to powwows. I went out to powwows and I got strange feelings and the hair on my head would stand up when the Indians danced, sang, and beat the drum. To me, there was something special going on here and we didn't find it in the Lutheran or the Catholic Church. So I went off on a long, a long path, looking, look, discovery, looking for anything that was different, anything that was beyond the simple life that these people were living, their simple values and so on. The Sisseton Sioux uh, and the other people, they were all called Sioux because the French came down and they said all the people who live here are Sioux. But really they were all different tribes and they spoke different languages. So we had a mix of these, we had Datsa, we had Blackfeet, we had Crow, we had all kinds of people living here. The old men in hushed tones would talk and wonder about some of the religious ceremonies they did. One called the Sun Dance in particular, in which they pierced themselves and would dance into an ecstatic state and take trips out of their body and travel over the lands hunting for the buffalo and visiting with the spirits in the world of the invisible world. So this caught my fancy at a very early age, only in grade school, uh, eight, nine, ten years old. And um, I, as time went by, I discovered that, you know, there were people in other parts of the world that did things that were very similar. I was blessed with a big library in the school, so I lived in the encyclopedias and the books. I actually started reading encyclopedias in seventh grade. I start with volume A of one set and I'd read everything in there. Then I go to volume B and read everything in there. And I found out there were people in other parts of the world that believed and did things differently than they did in this white Judeo-Christian culture of the little farming community that I lived in. And I longed to understand more about what these people were doing. Early on, I ran into some of the early issues of National Geographic magazine. That was a wonderful thing to discover. And I found that um, there were people in places like India that did very odd things that would be considered weird, but <laughs> weird by uh, Western Christian values. But they weren't any weirder than the things that I knew my Native American friends did or had done in this very place we were living in. So this was my thrust in life. My thrust in life was then to, um, number one, explore all the different ways and different things that people had experienced in life. And then, by the time I got to my early teens, I figured, well, if I can figure out how to do this and not let it be known what I was doing, I would try to experience what they had experienced in whatever way I possibly could. And part of that, involved getting, um, finding and experimenting with my own body because all of these things that the people in like India or Africa or the Native American people, like the people where I lived, the Mandans in particular did, involve body rituals. 
In other words, for some reason, the body had to be involved in something where you were seeking something beyond the body. And the Native American people, and from what I picked up from them in their in connection with them physically, they had a different set of feelings and values. For instance, there wasn't just one big God looking over everybody. They didn't think there was such a thing. It didn't exist to them. There was just spirit. And the spirit was infused in everything. It was in the trees, it was in the water, it was in the clouds, it was in our own bodies. So they felt there was spirit in everything, and to me that appealed. So many similarities between some cultures that I have run into and people I have lived with um, through my lifetime. You know, the similarity between what goes on in some of the Hindu culture, what goes on in some of the Middle East cultures, like the the uh, dervishes of the Sufi. They were also very much into the same mindset, the same set of values, the same kinds of practices. So this has been my lifelong uh, approach, is to, is to uh, explore. Uh, spiritual exploration, you might call it, looking for spirit, trying to find spirit, trying to find spirit using traditional methods that people over thousands of years you know, had tried to, uh, have found work. The first thing that I tried when I was in my teens, uh, since I knew about, heard about firsthand uh, about the Sundance, I knew the Sundance was something that had been given to the Native Americans where I lived. Uh, the Lakota people were very, a lot of Lakota where I lived, so and I spoke a little Lakota with them. Uh, they did a, a, a ritual once a year at least, called a Sundance. And there were individual Sundance and there was the group Sundance done in, like with a congregation in a church. Uh, at the time I was a boy, the Sundance was outlawed. Uh, any Native Americans caught doing the Sundance, especially on an Indian reservation, which is where you would do it, because it's isolated, uh, you, would be you would be sentenced, it was a criminal offense, and you would, could be sent to 20 years in prison for doing your religious ceremony. Now what they were trying to do, as it turns out, very much was be <coughs> piercing in what is what's called the heart chakra, because that's the one that's the most blocked. So it was almost always in the chest, either with one or two piercings. And the uh, piercings were attached to cords. There were little piercings made and um, pegs inserted and a, a, a skin line there, thongs attached to a long pole. The object of the Sundance was not to rip free originally. Later on, it got to be that way because the, per, the whole practice got perverted. But the main practice was to dance against these piercings. And in the solo dance that you might do, it was done just an individual and the group would gather around and they would pray and be with him in spirit. It was holding space, holding space while he did this ritual, extreme physical ritual. So what you do is start out with a piercing in the morning, facing the sun, and it didn't need to be a solid pole, it could be a springy one. The object then would be to look at the sun and pull back and constantly be pulling against this piercing. And in time, as we know now, it kicked in what we call endorphins, and you would go into a trance state. And you would not feel pain, but you would start getting into an ecstatic state. And if you kept doing this, you would do this all day long. As the sun moved, you would be moving around the pole from east to west. You would be moving north to south. You would be moving around the, the movement of the sun. And the only time you could stop and finish this, if you were really serious, was when the sun set. So this was a day-long thing that you did. And you'd usually do it pre-doing pre it with prayers and fasting. And uh, sometimes you would even do it without water. So you would be dehydrated. Now this has become a feature of this Sundance that the Native Americans did and some of the spiritual suspensions and pulls. See, I don't see there's any difference, you're seeking spirit here, any difference between doing a Sundance and doing a suspension. They're just variations of the same kind of a body ritual. When I was 17, I did my first Sundance. I went out into, on my bicycle into a place called where, where the Native Americans had actually done this, Tacoma. I went to Tacoma and I found a place where the Indians had camped. I found a place where they had actually done this thing. There was nobody here. 
and I attached a thong, a leather thong, like a shoestring thing for a boot to a tree, a long one, and I pierced myself, just a single piercing, and I attached the thong to the piercing, and I pulled, and I pulled, and I knew the object, later on some of the myth, and later on some of the people that did this, the object was to rip free. There's a part of this where that happens, but I, I did this in spades and actually ripped free in a film called Dance is Sacred and Profane. But the object here is not to rip free, but to see how long you can do this. And the longer you do it, the deeper trance state you go into. And one of the early things is an initiation was an initiation for the Lakota and many other native tribes out there, the Ogallala or the people that did this. Uh, the main purpose for this was to give you discipline and training, physical discipline. The next thing it was to do was to get you to learn to go into trance states. And in the trance states, you were supposed to go out and meet the white spirit. Wankintanga in the Lakota language, Wankintanga is the great white spirit. Who is this? Where is this? What is this great white spirit? This mythical, I don't know what you would call it, connection with the God self, so to speak. They believed there was a God self for every person. Every person could go out and meet their God self. And this is the great power that would give you, empower you to do most anything. And the way to meet it would be to do this physical ceremony called the sun dance, or in the Mandan later on, I found out they did one called the Okipa ceremony where they did the suspensions. And the Ogallala also did suspensions with piercings. I understood that the object was to get over the feeling of discomfort or pain because when you pull and you pierce and so on, there's what well, there's physical pain. I found out later that like in yoga and Hindu culture and something called Laya Yoga, you learn to um, retranslate what we call pain to the point right now where people come in and say, I'm going to get pierced. Does it hurt? And I say, no, it doesn't hurt. There's just, there's no pain. All there is is intense physical sensation. If you take somebody and you stroke them, that's a physical sensation. If I take a skewer and push it through your cheek, that's the same thing. It's a sensation, it's just a little more intense. So what we call pain is our negative reaction to intense sensation. However, through yoga and other mental practices and physical practices, you can modulate or change any sensation. So you can take the most painful thing and eventually learn how to translate that and moderate it so it isn't like we consider pain. Uh, pain is um, a conjured up emotional feeling of Western culture. People's fear of pain is because they have been misconditioned or not conditioned to accept life in a physical body. In uh, uh, Eastern medicine, in Hindu practices, and Sufi practices and dervish practices, they teach you how to change this whole dynamic. So pain is a relative word. It's a pejorative negative word of Western culture. And the people that are doing suspensions and getting heavy tattoos and getting a lot of piercings have learned to transmit it. And they're also modern tributaries because they believe they own their body and they have the right to do with it whatever they want. Yeah, it was where you're going into the experience. Yeah. Now, if you're going in there with a negative feeling, like you're going into the doctor and he's going to do some medical procedure on you, most people fear and they say, can I have a shot? Can you knock me out? Can we do general anesthetic? Most people don't get appendectomies without anesthetic. But there are some people I know of that have done things like that because they have such control. <laughs> so pain is relative. The word is a pejorative negative word. This is something we're learning in Western culture, something they've known in Eastern culture, in Chinese medicine. They've known this for centuries, how you can help people over the hurdle of taking what we would normally consider pain. Pain is mainly mental. It's connected with fear more than it is physical sensation. And by going at this ritually and going at it in a trained sort of way, you can take any of these sensations and translate them into something different. Eventually what happens, you can translate it into ecstatic states. So I'm, I'm picturing in my mind, you're 17 years old when you did this first suspension. Mm -hmm. You'd already been doing body modifications for three or four years. Well, I wouldn't point. use that word body modifications. I have been using my body to explore spirit. 
you know, one of the first things I did, <laughs> um, just out of kicks, I wanted to see how it felt. In those days, there were no dryers for washing, and you had to hang your clothes up on a line. And in the wintertime in South Dakota, if you hung them out on the line, they would freeze. And if you took like long winter underwear and it off the line after it'd been out there, you do this with it, it would break and the leg would fall off. <laughs> so they hung them up indoors, like in a basement with lines there. So I had time once in a while, I would go down, there was this large bag of clamp clothespins back when I was a youngster. And I just for kicks thought, what the heck? I just started to clip them on my skin. And I found out that Oh, they hurt at first, but if I left them on for a while and I put them in the right place, after a while they didn't hurt, they kind of buzzed. They gave me a nice feeling there that you don't normally get. So I found you could translate physical sensation into a pleasant sensation, to an ecstatic sensation. And sometimes it even got erotic and I got sexually turned on when I reached puberty. All part of the same phenomena, same thing here. So. I experimented with those and then later on, like I said, I went in the summer, I pierced myself and I did the first Sundance and I really got a buzz on after I did it long enough. The first 10 minutes are tough. The next 20 minutes are better. After about an hour, I started to get a wonderful, warm, glowing sensation. I had no feeling of the piercing or the pulling on the piercing and the more I pulled on it, the deeper I got into this buzz, into this endorphin rush, it's called. Now this is not a trance, but it's the precursor to a trance. From there you go into many other stages of trance. How did you know when you had completed? Well, when I felt tired and I didn't go any further and I figured, gee, I don't know if I go any further, I might be in trouble here. Later on, when I started to do my first suspensions, and that was quite a bit later, after I found a book in Japan, it was an uh, original edition of Catlin's uh, Okipa ceremony bound in Morocco leather and stamped with gold. It got to Japan somehow. I was in Japan in the 1960s, and I went into the Kanda, the book section, uh, book seller section of Tokyo. And somewhere in the back, my t Japanese friend let me browse, and the guy in there was good because I had a Japanese friend with me. I found that book and I realized right away I had found a treasure. The guy had no idea what he had there. It was in a missionary's trunk or a, a traveler's trunk or an early uh, ambassador or somebody like that. That book had somehow gotten there from London, England, published by Catlin, and it had a description with color drawings of the Mandan Okipa ceremony and an explanation of what they did and what it was, what it meant to them. I bought the book for, I think, $30 in yen. It's probably worth $30,000 now. I have a copy of it. And it inspired me to go further because I had not had physical contact with Mandans because they were all dead and gone. Back in the 1830s or thereabouts, a white man had come up the Missouri River. They lived along the Missouri River in western South Dakota and up into North Dakota, where I've lived. And they brought with them this terrible disease. Now the Mandans were not hunter-gatherers that lived in little tents and moved around. They didn't do this. The Mandans were agricultural people and they lived in communities up to 25,000 people in a community. And they built large huts. They built out of wood and mud and stuff and they built like somewhere auditoriums that would hold as many as 50 or 100 people. They were like the kivas you find in, Me in New Mexico. They built large meeting places, and they had a totally different take on everything in a different language than the uh, surrounding that were people that were hunter-gatherers, than the Lakota or the uh, uh, Ogallala, the other peoples that lived in this area. So, um, oddly enough, uh, I got very fascinated by that because this was his description before they died out from smallpox. There are virtually no people with even one quarter or one eighth Mandan blood anymore, and the customs all vanished after the 1830s and the 50s, it was gone. So the only reference we had to this, the only feeling I, I could get was Catlin's description. It was very graphic and very real, and his drawings, it turns out, were really very accurate. He went back to England, 
and he published this book and put up his paintings and people said, oh, this is a figment of your magic. Nobody has ever done this. You just imagined this and conjured it all up. Archaeologists and ethnographers later on found it was all very real. He was doing a very accurate job of recording their religious ceremony. So I saw, well, this is as deep or deeper than what, what I've run into in the Sundance, you know, with the Lakota people. So after my trip to Japan and after finding the book, it was fate that brought me to the book and the book that brought, was brought to me. My whole life has been filled with coincidences like this, by the way. It's my search and my quest. And always when I need something, I don't go and try to find it. It finds me. Or I find myself in a situation wherever I need to learn or know something new, it just comes to me or I'm drawn to it or a, a teacher or a guru. It's been my whole life has been that way. And that's how I learned what I learned. What experience did you have? You know? Oh, I was high, on a high. I had an endorphin rush. I went as far as I thought it would safely go. You know, I was being cautious. I wasn't going to overdo it. I wasn't going to dance out there till I ripped free or anything. Okay. Later on I did, but I didn't. <laughs> on the first time, I discovered an avenue to inner self. You know, and that's like what suspensions and things can do today, regardless of the reason you're doing it. It will help you find your inner self, your inner strength, etc. It's a challenge, and soon you find out it isn't what it looks like. Suspensions, if they're done right, are not what they look like. You know, it's what they feel like, what the energy is. People that get into ecstatic spaces will radiate energy, just like a light bulb radiates light and heat. You get somebody who's really going for this in a spiritual sort of a way, and you can tell what's going on if you're sensitive. I mean, the energy oozes out of them and just radiates when you get into that state of consciousness. That's what it's all about. I kept all of this for my family. Now, all my experiments I had to do in private and secret for all my early years, and I did many, many things. This is interesting how I did this. <laughs> I had to cover it up because this didn't fit the Christian and the Lutheran ethic at all. In fact, if I had let it be known what I was doing privately, my little practice of rituals I was exploring, at this point in time in the 30s and 40s in this country, I would have been taken to a mental institution, locked up and the key thrown away. Believe me, that's what would have happened. <laughs> Maybe lobotomized. Yes, they did that. They did that. They had a place in Redfield, South Dakota for the feeble-minded and the, yeah, they had a place for people, and they did do things like that, yes. Did at some point you come out to your family, and what was your Never. reaction? Never. Even into my later life. Uh, I made movies. I said, you want to see my movie? No, don't want to see it. I did a book. Oh, you want to see my book? Can I give you my book? No, I don't want to see it. So that's the attitude I had all the way until the very, very end, and then I never had a resolve on that. My mother lived to be 98. And I sat with her eating popsicles when she was aged and all her friends had died. And she still didn't want to hear this. But there was a secret part of her life and she would skip about a five year period. I've always been curious. I could never quite find out what happened to her that changed her attitude toward us, her husband and her kids. Something in there happened. But okay. she never was curious enough to really want to know what I was doing. And your brothers and sisters? Um, well, I used to freak out my sister. I had a sister, and when I discovered that, oh, you could take things like a needle and push it through you, and it didn't really hurt if you had the right state of mind when you did it, I'd say, hey, Karen, she, you know, look what I can do. And I'd push a needle through my skin like this and freak her out. You know. <clears throat> and my, uh, my uh, other brother, well, I had two brothers. And one of them died in early age. He was a Lutheran minister in Texas. And the other one uh, had a very unhappy marriage and he got to a very high position in Silicon Valley and uh, it all blew apart and he was on the verge of committing suicide. He moved back to the old hometown, he found God and now he's an evangelistic preacher who works with prisoners in the jail. <laughs> he knows something about it and uh, I'm the devil's agent. Uh, I get near this subject and it gets horrible. It's ugly. Uh, we can't really face each other. Unless we talk about the weather or things, you know. How's your car running? I mean, that's okay, but don't get into anything deeper than that. 
I had a similar. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> I says, go ahead. You can do this, but it's a waste of time. Um, I think that uh, the taboos that we are facing in Western Judeo-Christian culture have broken down radically. And I saw the biggest change, and I was a part of it, I think, from the 1960s on. You know, in the 1960s, we had the, the, the flower power and all this stuff. All of this is a breaking down of the taboos, even till today. I mean, God, who would have ever thought this crazy Chinese practice of sticking needles in people called acupuncture would ever be covered by medical insurance? But it is. And I have friends who are in that business and learning it, you know. Is that where the uh, relationship between BDSM and suspension really comes? Is, is about the taboos and the control of it your body? It has to do with your view of the body. I consider a modern primitive, anybody that says, all I've been taught is bullshit. My mother doesn't own my body. My husband or my wife doesn't own my body. The church doesn't own my body. And I don't believe that God fellow owns my body either. I own my body. I live in this body. And the person that lives in this body owns this body, and I have absolutely all the right in the world to do whatever I want to do with it. Ownership of the body is the key to the whole thing. People in BDSM, same thing. You shouldn't do this. Oh, you don't do those things. They're sacrosanct. They're taboo. Bullshit. If you do it safely, the only thing is that when you do these things, when you think that this is the way it really is, you have to be sure that when you do this, you're not doing harm to other people. You learn that lesson early in the game. If you're doing harm to other people one way, in any way, what emotionally, physically, or otherwise, this is bad karma, as they'll teach you in, in the Hindu, Eastern um, way of thinking. It'll come back and hit you. Starting in the 60s, this freedom, see here's number one. The Christian ethic that was evolved early on and clung and one of that we're fighting, one of the taboos we're fighting is the body is the temple of God. You shall not mess with it unless God gives you the okay. Who is God? Is some guy sitting on a throne? No, that's an imaginary guy sitting in a cone. It's God created in man's image. Men created that God. So that's why the taboo is bullshit. It is really bullshit. So what happened in the 1960s, and this is where I say, the modern primitive movement, and this is where Fakir had his role as a role model, came along and says, forget it, guys. That isn't true. The body isn't the temple of God. You're in charge. It's your temple. Uh, you can do anything you want with your body, and you don't have to go, God, can I do this? Can I color my hair purple or whatever? Can I poke a hole in it and wear a big ring in my ear? You don't have to do that because it, this God doesn't exist. Just like the Native Americans and the Hindu and the Chinese people with Chinese medicine, they don't believe that. That isn't so. So you don't need to go to God's intercessor. You don't, who's his intercessor? Priests and, and holy people, okay, in Western culture. You don't have to go and get their permission. Next, how about your parents? You don't need your parents' permission to see if you need to purple, color your hair purple or do get a piercing. It's your body. You own your body, and you have the right to do with it as you wish. That's my main message. You, have, you own your body, and only the person that lives in that body has the right to decide what to do with that body, even if it's destroy it. Because I had to keep all this secret from my family, and I needed a place to practice or do this when I felt like it, uh, when I was about 12 or 14 years old, 14 I guess it was, 14 years old, junior high, um, I, I said to my mother, this is like World War II, 1944. I said, uh, I'm going to be a photographer, Mom. There was no place in this house with a sister and two other brothers that you could go. No doors were lockable anywhere. You couldn't be private anywhere. So I said, I'm going to be a photographer. But to do that, I need a dark room. She said, a little room down in the cellar where she put her fruit in the fruit cellar. It had a door, it had the potential of a lock. I says, can I use that for a dark room? I said, okay, Raleigh, go ahead. So I did, I put a big bolt on the door on the inside and whenever I wanted to do something, like I was gonna do a mini pull, I would put needles in and attach it to the wall and just get into a groove doing this, uh, I would have the door bolted. I, she'd come and knock on the door, Roland, time to go to dinner. No, I can't do that. I'm in the dark room now and I'm developing film. Oh, okay. You couldn't open the door. Here with this film doing this. We did it like this in those days. Under red light, 
with chemicals in a bath and a little clip on each end of the film. You do this and rock it first, and then you go into the next one and so on. So that was my cover. Whenever I needed to do something, I'd lock myself in the dark room and do it indoors. Well, I continued these practices and they got more rad as time went by and I explored more things. Um, my first, after, in 1961, I went to Japan and came back after three months. I found the book and I decided, in addition to the Sundance, which I had already done a mini or two or three, I decided I wanted to do the suspension in the style of the Mandan Indians called in a ceremony, the whole ceremony is called Okipa, but the key part for the initiate is the hanging up. And the object there is to get a person out of their body to travel out into the unseen world. But the object of it was they would take them into the lodge and they do the piercing, bring them into the lodge. They would attach cords to the lodge. It would go up through a hole in the roof. It's not done outdoors with a mandan. And men on the roof would then pull on it and they'd tap on it every time they wanted to increase the pinch pressure, the tension, the pickup, until finally they'd lift him off his feet. And then they would spin him around slowly and he was supposed to go into a trance. Well, the, the pain, the intense physical sensation is so intense that your body almost involuntarily, the spirit and the body separate. This is the purpose of this, to get the two to come apart. I've always stuck with the way it was done traditionally and for the reasons it was done traditionally, which is to teach people, number one, you can control your body, you control what goes on in your feelings about your body and the physical sensations in your body. In sports suspensions, this is what you do. You're going to do something that's radical, thrilling, different, emotional, and psychologically a big deal. But you do the same when you learn to come down a mountain on skis. I tried that. You can do, you can do bungee jumping if you're going to race motorcycles. So that's why I call it sport suspension because in a sense it has all the same characteristics as thrilling sports that you might get involved in, you know. And if you don't go any further then it's fine. You've learned to master your body. You've learned physical discipline and control. You've learned you can get beyond what's called quote pain unquote. You can transmute it into ecstatic states, which you definitely can get racing downhill on skis or some of the jumping out of an airplane or hanging by suspension hooks under a hot air balloon. I mean, this is a thrilling thing. It doesn't mean you're going to go out of your body and meet God. You've got to remember that back in the Native Americans, the Kasika, back in the Hindu practices back 2,000 years ago, one of the purposes was for you to go out out of your body into a world that you can't experience when you're living in your body. The greater part of it is the, what's the intent? What are you trying to accomplish here? What are you trying to do? Why are you doing this? And, um, you know, even the sport suspensions, what I call sport suspensions, I think is justifiable if you just learn more about yourself. Hey, I can do this. You're facing your own fears. That is a great accomplishment. If you can go one step beyond that and say, in addition to facing my fears, I can also escape my body and I can escape the limitations of this world and I can experience things that you can't experience any other way, except maybe with psychedelics. You're doing something radical to the body or a physical life. That's the same thing that happens if you're doing LSD or ayahuasca or peyote. You're doing something real radical to your physical structure. When you hang by flesh hooks, that's what you're doing. It just gives you an opportunity to open doors that you've never been through. If a person has never seen something, they will never do it. So, you know, I mean, we were setting examples. So I was Roland Raleigh Loomis. And I did all these things for 30 years, mostly in private, and then I met people I could share it with. Uh, like my big best, Okipo, was 1967. I met Davy Jones, my tattoo artist, that did my tattoo. Well, <clears throat> I had made, I had a vision since I was a teenager of this mark on my body. I kept seeing it in visions. I seen it in dreams. So finally, I made a photograph of my full-size back and sides, and I started to put tissue on there and draw till I got on that tissue what I kept seeing in a vision. And then I drew it up in very st strict form, very detailed, 
And for years, I went around to tattoo artists, uh, and I wanted to get this put on me. I didn't want Betty Boop. I didn't want an anchor, you know. So I went to a mini Minneapolis and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and St. Louis. I went into artists, young kid. I come in with this board, this artwork. I said, you do t tattooing? I say, sure. I said, I'd like this tattooed on my back. And they look at it and say, oh, that's great, Sonny, but how about a panther on your arm? Nobody, but nobody would do anything that wasn't up on the wall. The idea of putting some symbolic thing on, like they do in the South Pacific or New Zealand, totally alien all the way 1950s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s. Called tribal tattooing. Well, uh, you know where that went. <laughs> That, that taboo got broken after a while, and like facial tattooing, that taboo got broken. See, my whole goal is to try to get this strong connection between body and spirit, so I say spirit plus flesh, to get the two in harmony with each other. When you do, you can't make a mistake. You won't feel, you know, you won't say, oh shit, I should never have done this, or you won't end up in a hospital. I've had three transformative experiences in my life. Starting when I was 17, that was against the coal bin wall, where it was bondage, and it was a very hard physical thing, and it was also a very heavy ritual thing, where I had my first out-of-body experience when I was 17 years old, which is described in some of my literature and on some of the other things that I've you know, done on tape. Um, the second one was right out here in this place, when Davy Jones and a friend came over, I had tried doing the Okipa after Japan, and I ran into the Catlin book. Uh, I, I had absolute passion I had to do this ritual. I had to be hung up, and I had to do it this way. And I had to do it from the chest, because that was the one in the strongest energy center, the heart chakra, which is halfway between the bottom ones and the top ones. So this is the crucial chakra, the bridge chakra, like a teeter-totter, it's the fulcrum, the heart chakra. That's why most of the important suspensions that a person could do are done either here or across the back. Some of the others don't count because there are no chakra centers there, no energy points, you know. I can't see any point in hanging by knees, except it's novel because there are no chakras in the knees, you know, okay. So my, uh, uh, my main second uh, transformative experience was an Okipa done very seriously and ritualistically with help. Because after I tried it myself in 1963, I was buzzing off and I realized that they would find dead meat hanging here in about 12 hours. You just don't do this without people there to take you down when you're not there anymore or you're on the verge of physically dying. Well, the one out here was probably the most significant. First, I learned I'm not my body. I can leave my body. When you're out of your body, there is no time or space. Uh, there are no limitations. You have a body of sorts. When you're out of your physical body, you're in this gray body, this electrical body of electrical stresses or what it has all the fingers, arms, legs, and toes you have. But if you try to walk through a wall, you can walk through a wall. If you try to float, you float. If you think like, I'm over here, you'll be there just like in uh, True Blood with the vampire. <laughs> same, same thing. You experience that for real if you can get into this conscious out-of-body state. The one I did out here, I knew about the out-of-body state. And I knew that's the ultimate goal of doing this suspension, this Okipa thing. So I took two or three days of preparation of fasting and oh, I did everything I, that they did. In the, in, in, in the Mandan Indian tribe, I did pretty much duplicated everything they did physically and mentally. And then it was like, um, I'd been up all night, Davy Jones and his friend were here, everything was rigged, it was over in this other space, there was nothing in here at that time, this wasn't here, this room. And I had rigged it up like a Mandan lodge. So I gave him, a, he, he understood, he read the description of the thing and he made me sign a thing that if, if I was injured or dead, I would not hold him responsible. And I had to have it notarized. I had to get him a notarized release so he would do this. He says, this, we're gonna take this all the way. I says, yes we are. So we went in here at like six in the morning just as the sun was coming up. That's about when I would start this and uh, attach the rope. I pierced myself, they didn't pierce me. I pierced myself, I did not use hooks. I used 14 gauge wire deep. Because I had done this before, it works great. No ripping, no tearing, no blood. 
None. I've done it four or five times that way. No problem. <clears throat> so they hooked me up to the rope, and I said, now look, this is the deal. I want you to just inch me up. Every time I want up, I'll just do this. And when I stop, you stop. Okay? And finally, when I've got almost all my weight onto the piercings, I'm probably going to try to swing free. And if I do, I'm standing on a box, a little square thing. It says, when I do that, I don't want any chance of backing out. I want you to take it away immediately and see where this goes. Okay? This was the biggie. This was really, really a turn on one. So we did this right next door here. So just like in the Mandan Lodge at the crack of dawn, and I, I got on the box and they lifted me up and it took, you know, we're going to take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do this. We're not just going to jerk you up there. Like they did, the Mandans didn't just jerk them up there. So here I am on the box and more weight is going on. I've used all my yogi principles I've been practicing and everything to transmute and change the feeling of sensation. It is intense to try to do this. It is intense. That's why very few people have done it. So they're lifting me up. They're lifting me up. It's taking 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I don't really know how long it was. And finally, I was just on my very tippy tiptoes. About 90% of my weight was on. It was so intense. I said, I don't know if I, at this point, I was half-assed to say, I quit. Really. And I thought, oh, fuck it. It's like jumping off a cliff or committing suicide. You stepped off the box and they took it away. I had no way back. And within about five seconds, I'd say one. Uh, warm glow, no pain. Warm glow, no pain. And I realized, oh, I'm not in my body. I'm floating out. I floated up to the ceiling over here. I looked up and there was a white light. Okay? And the white light spoke to me, just like what they expected with the Indian boys. It says, I said, who are you? It says, I'm you and you're me, and I'm as close to God as you're ever going to be. Oh, do you always look like a white light? No, I look like what you think I'm going to look like. <laughs> I look like a toad or rock or whatever. So I had a long telepathic conversation out of my body with the white light, and I wanted to go into it. I had felt a love like I've never, ever felt before. It was just, whoa, there's nothing in the world like this. And I says, I want to come in there. And he says, no, 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 you can't come in here. If you come in here, you're dead physically. That's the end of this life. You have a job to do. i got to send you back down again. So, But I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I, this is actually G-O-D. As close as anybody that lives down here can ever get close to G-O-D, this was it. And I felt that connection. Once you make that connection, it's always there. If I just don't let myself get caught up in the hurly-burly of the world, I always feel I can go back, breathe, do yoga, connect with my higher body. My final suspension? Oh, I'm going to slip into that space and stay there. Of course, that's called DEA death. Eventually, I have to leave this body. I don't know when or where. I'm suing. I'm doing pretty well. I'm going on 83 now. And uh, I, until my job is done. When my job is done, I'll probably go like Doug Malloy. Doug Malloy was in the same position. We had a very close... He understood exactly what I'm telling you now. That's why we hit it off. He would go off and sit on an asteroid in his astral body and talk to people from other places. He was a great believer that if you want to do space exploration, it's kind of stupid to take your body out there. It's too hard to keep it going when you get out of Earth's atmosphere. Why bother with that when you can leave your body and your consciousness and travel to Mars or to Venus or some other place? I was put into a body several times, and I have a memory from my previous body. I actually was a mandan Arikara combination Indian in about the 1830s or 40s. And I met a, a terrible death at, at age 23 or thereabouts in an Indian war that was going on. I was a scout on a pony, and uh, I was riding along a familiar place, the border of Minnesota and South Dakota, where you go down the hill and then you get in Minnesota. It's wooded and rocky. And we had enemies over there, and they were going to attack us. And I, had, I was part of several tribes come together. We were having a very hard time. We were starving to death, and they were going to come over and attack us. 
And as I discovered where they were and I figured when and where they were going to come, I was heading back on my pony to let the rest of my people know. You know, my mother was a Ricker and my father was a Mandan. And I knew Mandan. I had a Mandan name. I was Otiso Otu Tambukana. That was my name. And as I was coming back on my pony, these people had set a trap along the banks of the Yellow Bank River, as an Indian name. And it was piles of crap. And it was all tied up with rope or something like rope. And they didn't want me to get back, so they cut the rope, and they all came down and crushed me and my pony. I grew up in this world, in my new, this body right here, I grew up in this world. That was a reoccurring nightmare for the first six years of my life, was being crushed to death. And then later I learned that was a memory I had from that previous life I had as Tiso. As Tiso. The third transformative experience was doing the same ritual that I did out here, by then, I had made permanent piercings in my chest so I could do this whenever I like. I had made them large and heavy so it was easier to do it. And then I went out and find a sacred Indian space on Thunder Basin National Grasslands. That was in the, that's Dance's yeah. Sacred and Profane film. And we were buddies together. We did the sun dance first. Then we went over in this cottonwood tree and I twisted myself up. And again, just like out on the thing in here, uh, when I finally got to a point where I lifted off, and it's slow, I didn't go up like this. When it was slow, I went out of my body again, and instead of meeting my white light, I met my white light and went boom, right through it. And I took a zoom, 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 zoom trip. The closest I can describe it would be if you've ever watched two, the movie 2001. Do you remember when the guy escapes hell over there and he gets in the thing, and then he finally out in the little scooter baby, and he's going ch 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 that's what the trip was like. And I call it a trip into the cosmos. I met the cosmic beings. There is cosmic beings. And the only way you can get there is to leave your body and go out there in what's really you, your consciousness. Consciousness exists, it's permanent, it never dies. It may not be identified with this exact same name and this exact same body, but you are you and you'll always be you and you just keep moving along, you never die. The only way you can get real understanding of you and your connection to Earth is to have one of these experiences. And there are only several ways you can do that. I've had uh, the great pleasure of having that experience in several different ways. I'm also very, very friendly with a lot of people who have used plant magic. Plant magic will get you there too. It's physically difficult. It's almost as difficult or more so than hanging by flesh hooks. I found my way hanging in a cottonwood tree in Wyoming, but other people have found it other ways. I found it easier after I did this to go and use plant magic. I can go, I go to the same places with plant magic, but only in special ritualized places with people I can trust and people who are spiritually advanced. I wouldn't go you know, with a 10 foot pole with people who are experimenters. That's what happens with a lot of people in suspension. They're experimenters and they don't really understand the full depth that they can get to with this practice. They don't really understand that. And as long as they stay there, fine. But if they ever have a feeling of dissatisfaction, I went to a Suscon and I hung for 20 minutes and drank a Coca-Cola and smoked a cigarette or whatever they do. I came back, I did this three times. And I don't know, I'm just not getting out of it anything special, you know. I mean, I got a great bunch of photos, we got a beautiful video. They maybe come to me. I've had a lot of people do that and say, well, I really want more. If I feel they're sincere and they're willing to wait six months, a year, two years, I had one woman wait three years before I would suspend her. Till I felt internally in me, it was, her time was right. And then I did it. And she had a wonderful experience. So uh, in this turn of developments, I've kind of developed a, a history of how things happen. I got, ex for my teenage years, I got very excited about the idea of piercing and pulling or hanging by piercings. And I got into the business of exploring how to make and do piercings and what the energetic side of piercings is all about. So that became my school. That's Fakir Intensives. Anyone wants to do this and have not just the mechanical, the medical aspects, they need to come to my school. We also teach the energetic and we teach that as a third component is just as important as the mechanical. And I feel the same way about suspensions and or hook pulls. 
I introduced the idea of hook pulls and the ball dance. And those all came in from very early period in the 1950s and 1960s. But I was always trying to bring this in with understanding that these were borrowed from other cultures and we should honor and respect the other cultures and should have some understanding of what it meant and what the intent was of doing these things. I mean, because in these cultures, it wasn't generally just a photo op or to scare your friends or amuse people at a party. And they had a different reason for doing these things. So I call, you know, mainly the suspensions that uh, I've been involved with in bringing into the culture by example. I never went in as a preacher or somebody who was trying to do it in that. I would just do it and say, hey, take a look. If you'd like to do this, see me. Or I will help you try to do this yourself. But I call those like mostly spiritual suspensions. They're done to try to make a connection between the spirit and the body and use the body as the door, the means to reach spirit. So uh, the purpose of uh, spiritual suspensions is to get you, first of all, into a trance state where you transcend pain. There is no pain. Pain becomes ecstatic thing. It might even get sexual. You might get a sexual kick out of it. That's fine. That's a part of the whole thing. You go beyond that, you might get, um, you might have some inner vision. You might see things that aren't there. Like it's like people get this piercing up here, or especially up in the third eye up here. That's your insight chakra. I say, well, this is fine and good. Keep in touch and let me know when you see dead people. That's a sure sign we've got opened your, 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 third, your uh, sixth chakra up here, okay? And then again, transformation. In my case, it was transformative. Uh, my second transformative experience was meeting my own God self and finding I had a permanent, long-lasting connection. It put me here in a body. It's going to take me out when my job is done, and that's all there is to it. So these are the reasons why you'd want to do this. So what happened? I was doing this back when I was only 14 years old, experimenting with piercing and pulling and all that sort of thing. And so I put out a lot of pictures. The main ones were published. The first, first go around publicly was in Modern Primitives book. I met the juries. They were filming a film basically about Charles Gatewood and the Wacko community. Then I was part of the Wacko community that met them halfway through their film. And they start finding out what I did. And for the next thing I know, they said, gee, we got to make more stuff on Fakir. And we ended up in Wyoming filming this uh, Okipa ceremony that I did uh, near Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And did things yeah. like that. Where does money and fit I in? I don't have a lot of money. I'm 83 and I have no way to retire. I have to keep working or I can't pay the bills and I can't drive a Prius and things like that. <laughs> no, here's what happened. My guru told me what really happened. When I was about 12 years old, my higher mental body threw me into contact with charismatic religious features, people who have really had power, grip. Some, they may have been in conventional religion. One of them was Dr. Walter E. Meyer. He was the great speaker for the Lutheran Hour. I got to sit by him and he blessed me. I, what the heck is he doing here? There was a reason for that. So all of my life I've been thrown in touch with these charismatic with various groups, oddball people you'd never expect to meet, people doing plant magic or whatever. Uh, but my guru, Arthur, explained it to me. He says, Roland, you either willingly or unwillingly assume the role of a shamanic role. And what this means is you have to use the power you've been given to get everything you need, but only when you need it. So for that reason, you're never going to have $100,000 in the bank. Because if you do, you will lose your power. So if you need an airplane ticket, you just focus your attention on it, and somebody will come along and give you an airplane ticket. Damned if they didn't. If you need a car, somebody will say, you need a car and buy you a car. If you need a computer, I had one uh, person in my life still around get where I do my school. I said, you need a computer. And a year later, he says, you need a better computer. And the box would come, and I'd just get another computer. Uh, so this is the life that I've led pretty much even till today. I never make much money and like Carla said, I hand it away if I have resources or something. I don't say, well, you got to sign a contract. And, oh, I want from you. I, when you get your finished piece here, I, I, I demand two DVDs. Is that the deal? That's the deal. We can do that. Two DVDs. That is on tape. 
It's on, well, it isn't tape. It used to be tape. Yeah, that's right. In my day, it was tape. In my day, I love tape. I was the ad manager for Ampex Audio Products back in 1960. I met with Les Paul and Mary Ford when their Ampex built 24 track machine wasn't performing right and had to walk through with them and fix it. <laughs> I have trained about six people to do suspensions and hook pulls and I've watched them go off. I have protégés. That's one of my other jobs is to teach protégés how to do this and get that into what they're doing. And some have been remarkably successful. I have Yossi Silverman. He's an Israeli. He's in the heavy duty into the male SM community. He goes to Chicago, Hellfire and all that stuff. And he goes up there every summer and he's got a big rep. Everybody wants him to do this now with them there because he has learned how to make it a shamanic act rather than just a mechanical procedure. And I think, you know, the more I see of that, the more positive my feeling is going to be. Uh, same thing happens like with a ballet troupe <laughs> taking another art form. That is an art form. But some ballet troops and some performers in ballet will actually radiate out something from what they're doing. And others, it's just a beautiful, flawlessly executed communication. Or music. You have the same thing in playing like, some people can play a piano and it's enchanting. And other people play it and it's technically fantastic. They're going to ten times the tempo anybody's ever played it. But it's cold. Yeah. It has no feeling. It has no soul. When did you first realize how much of an influence you were going to have on these suspension communities? It was much after the fact. I get shocked every now and then to find out I've had that much impact. <laughs> People in faraway places in other languages will say, you've really changed my life. And no, it's, you know, or, you know, it's, I've experienced the, the being quasi-famous and it's really kind of scary. It's good, it's gratifying, but it can be very unpleasant if you have to like pee real bad and you can't get to the lavatory. <laughs> um, how does it feel looking at the fruits of all the seeds you've sown over the decades? Well, I'm very gratified. I feel, you know, that's why I didn't leave this earth long ago. I mean, I had a job to do and it was like to be an example. I'm not, I'm not teaching by plum. I'm not writing a book. I don't like books. I'm never going to write a book. I don't like writing a book. I will talk. I'm a storyteller. I'll talk to a television camera. I'll talk to you. I'll make a film. But I, I've tried many times to write my memoir, and I can't do it. Jim Ward wrote a memoir. A lot of people have done that, and I would have a hell of a memoir to write. But somehow it's too remote. So I'm a storyteller. I'm telling my story to this camera. <laughs>